Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're going over chapter three, which is solely focused on carbohydrates, which I'm really excited about. Not that I have a favorite macronutrient, but carbohydrates are pretty awesome. So some learning objectives, we're gonna be talking about basic sugars and sweeteners. We're gonna be talking about um, the differences between starch and fiber. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep in mind my plate. Uh, we're gonna talk about whole grain again, and we're gonna talk about the functions of carbohydrate in the body. We're going to talk about how it's absorbed, how to prevent diabetes, um, and we're going to talk at the very end just some ideas for um, creative menu dishes using whole grains and legumes. Okay, so carbohydrates can, can be broken down into sugars, starches, and fibers, um, and they should provide most of the energy for our body, which is really interesting because we hear so much um, about protein being talked up. And yes, protein is essential for the body, but as you can see, the percentage of the calories that we should be intaking, the majority should come from carbohydrates, as you see on the slide. The recommendation is anywhere from 45 to 65%. You can tinker with that percent, but it typically, carbohydrates tend to be the majority of um, your, your calorie intake. So keeping in mind, meat, poultry, and seafood do not contain any carbohydrates. So we're going to be talking about those in our um, chapter on protein. So just so you have um, kind of a reference, and you can kind of refer back to what we were talking about in chapter two. Um, for women, about one cup of carbohydrates is pretty general, recommended at each meal, and then two cups or two servings for men at each meal. So why are carbohydrates important? They're the most the most important function in the body is to provide energy. This is really, really important. Um, keep in mind that glucose is your body's primary source of energy. This is really important for you to keep in mind for the test. Um, under most circumstances, the brain and other nerve cells will only use carbohydrates for energy. So this is really important. I tell people all the time, if you want to be alert and awake, uh, especially for classes or for my lectures, make sure you've had a snack or a meal that has had some carbohydrates. Protein and fat will help sustain, make you feel full, but um, carbohydrates really uh, provide glucose, which is the, uh, the primary source of energy that your brain and your body utilizes. So they are found in various parts of the body, connective tissues, some hormones, enzymes, and genetic material. Um, this is a cool slide. I like to inc include the human body systems just to like remind us that the body is really complex and we can look at it um, by viewing different systems in the body. Um, you've got your circulatory system, your blood, that's basically where your blood is flowing to, nervous system, that includes your brain, um, respiratory system, your lungs, digestive system, we're really going to get into that, um, but that's basically all of the organs that are helping you break down and utilize food, your skeletal si uh, system, your bone structure, and then your muscular system. So digestion and absorption, we do talk a little bit about that. Most of the digestion absorption, and absorption of carbohydrates takes place in the small intestine. So the small intestine, if you're looking at this graph, is all of the, on the inside, all of these twists and turns and knots in the center in your, in your stomach. So, or not in your stomach, but if you're looking at your, um, I guess your abdominal cavity, then that's where your small intestine lives. So it's in the center, it's all the bunched up. Um, how would I describe this? <laughs> um, when I'm looking at it, I'm just like, oh, it's right there in the center because around the small intestine you'll see is a large colon. So the majority of your of the digestion and absorption of carbohydrates takes place in the small intestine. So during digestion, sugars and starches are broken down into single sugars such as glucose or fructose, and then they get absorbed. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose. Muscle um, glycogen is only used to supply energy for muscles. After you eat, you store carbohydrate in the form of glycogen. When blood glucose is low, liver glycogen releases glucose. So your body is very efficient. Even if it doesn't have a good source or immediate source of glucose, it will, it will manufacture some. Okay, this slide is really important. What I need you to know for the test is that insulin is a necessary hormone for glucose to leave the bloodstream and enter the body's cells. So insulin is a hormone that your pancreas produces, and this hormone is necessary um, for the breakdown and absorption 
or I should say the absorption of um, glucose. So glucose leaves the bloodstream and enters the body's cells. So this is really important. I just, that's all I want you to take away from this slide and it will come up on the test. So diabetes, when you're, um, this medical diagnosis is when your body either cannot make enough insulin, this is type two category, or cannot use its own insulin, that's type one. Because insulin reduces high blood glucose levels, glucose is going to build up in the blood of people with untreated diabetes. So that's why insulin is really important. And as I had said, insulin is a necessary hormone for glucose to leave the bloodstream and enter the body's cells. So there's a couple types of carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates I want you to remember for the test. So comple complex carbohydrates um, are we've talked about these actually so another word another way of thinking about complex carbohydrates is whole grains so starch and fiber is found in whole grains so you can kind of you can kind of um, remember them both that way so complex carbohydrates the way that I like to explain to people yes they contain starch but more importantly they contain fiber um, and the reason why they're called complex is because these chains of glucose um, there's many of them, so it takes more effort for the body to break down those carbohydrates. Whereas simple carbohydrates, which are sugars, um, those your body can eat a, easily break down and utilize right away. So again, I want you to remember for the test, starch and fiber are found in whole grains. So simple carbohydrates, also known as single sugars, can be thought of as glucose and fructose and remember for the test I want you to remember that glucose is the primary source of the body's energy so you just I also want you to remember that if you if, if you think of sugar remember that falls into the har carbohydrate category so remember there are three macronutrients carbohydrates protein and fat so if you think about sugar it falls into the carbohydrate category the book does talk about double sugars, which is two sugars that are bonded together, and that's um, sucrose, which is found in uh, white sugar. Another way of thinking about that, you can also call it table sugar. So I want you to remember that for the test, that sucrose is found in white sugar, aka table sugar. Okay, another thing, I wanna go back to this slide about um, talking about complex carbohydrates for the test, I want you to know a complex carbohydrate found in plants that is not digested by the human digestive system is called dietary fiber. So remember how I was saying the way that I distinguish between complex carbohydrates and simple carbohydrates is that complex carbohydrates have fiber. So I want you to remember for the test, a complex carbohydrate that is found in plants that is not digested by the human digestive enzymes is called dietary fiber. So you've got digestive enzymes. Remember I was saying the majority of carbohydrates are broken down in the small intestine. So starch and sugars are broken down, but fi dietary fiber is not. So it passes right through you, helps you um, with packing your stool and that evacuating the body, like helps you go to the bathroom. <laughs> okay, so um, simple sugars, we were talking about glucose is the most abundant sugar found in nature, most important source of energy for us and for plants. Um, interestingly enough, uh, blood glucose levels vital to health and having energy. Um, glucose is found in fruits and honey um, and many other plant foods. Uh, fructose is a specific uh, natural sugar that's found in fruits, but it's also found in honey. And then galactose is found in milk. Um, the sugar in milk is not very sweet though. <laughs> so this is just a little figure that breaks down. And for some of us who are more visual people, this might make sense to think of glucose, fructose, and galactose in this way. Here's just a picture of uh, sugar. This is the cane, uh, cane sugar and then sugar beets where white sugar or table sugar is made from. 
So functions of sugar in cooking and baking. Um, if you haven't taken your baking class, then this will be new. But if you have, then this is a refresher. Chef Rudy is really good about talking about the functions of each ingredient in pastries. Um, so sugar helps balance the acidity of ingredients, such as tomatoes and vinegar. Uh, sugar browns the crust in baking. Sugar helps retain moisture in baked goods so they stay fresh. Sugar affects texture, tenderizing. Um, and it also tenderizes. Uh, sugar also contributes to the rise of cakes, uh, cookies, and quick breads because it helps incorporate air into the batter during creaming. So you don't need to know a lot about the difference between the solid and the syrup sweeteners. So this is just more information if you want to go over that. Um, I'm not, we don't talk too much about the low or no calorie sweeteners, but do know if somebody has diabetes, then this, these are great alternatives for them. Uh, keep in mind that there is some controversy about the safety, especially aspartame, so, um, which is found in the sweetener equal. So if you don't have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, then I would refrain from using these um, artificial man-made sweeteners. And I, but I would recommend limiting our sugar consumption. Um, increased sugar consumption can lead to cavities. It can lead, it can lead to weight gain, and it can be a risk factor for diabetes. Although um, us being overweight or obese is also a risk factor for type two diabetes, as well as um, overconsumption of calories overall, studies show is an increased risk factor for type two diabetes. So not just high sugar intake, although that will contribute, but um, overconsumption of our calories, calorie needs as well. Um, this is for your information. No, uh, no need to go over this again. But one thing I will say with the sugar alcohols, it can't for some people that it can having too much of it can cause abdominal discomfort and diarrhea. I personally um, don't do well with them. They actually give me a headache and a tummy ache. So I don't use sugar alcohols very often or consume foods or beverages that utilize uh, sugar alcohol. One thing I do want you to keep in mind, especially for the test, is that stevia and monk fruit, because they come from plants just like table sugar or white sugar does, um, that this is a natural sugar alternative would be stevia or monk fruit because they come from a plant. So if you see on the test, um, a natural sugar alternative, keep in mind stevia and monk fruit because they come from a plant. So added sugars, like I was saying, I mean, it's really hard to avoid these if you think about, um, you can start looking at your nutrition labels, um, but added sugars are really everywhere. I mean, they're in ketchup, they're in barbecue sauce, they're in a lot of um, dr salad dressing. So sugar kind of pops up on, on our radar for a lot of foods. We're in, as I've said in previous lectures, we're in control if we're cooking um, from home, we can control how much added sugar goes into our food. But if we're eating anything that's canned, frozen, eating out, then we are most likely going to encounter added sugar. So um, one thing that I note here, the more added sugar is consumed from food and or sugar sweetened beverages, the more likely a person is to gain weight and become overweight or obese. So for any of us who are looking to make small changes in our diet, um, looking at what foods that we're eating currently that have added sugars and reducing our added sugar intake is a great place to start. Here are some examples of added sugars, but added sugars also refer to um, adding any kind of sugar, like here are even white sugars there too, adding any kind of sugar to a product that wasn't there before, or say a product did have sugar naturally, um, but they, the manufacturers decide to add more. A lot of times this is done for taste, right? If something tastes good, then we're gonna, it's it's more likely that we're gonna eat it. Sometimes it's used as a preservative. So um, like for example, uh, soda stays on the shelf for a long period of time and doesn't have to be refrigerated. So gotta be on the lookout for added sugars. Um, you may find added sugars in beverages. I had mentioned a few, but let's go over some of, just in case you were interested. Soda, fruit juices, sweetened teas, lemonade, sports drinks, vitamin waters, and energy drinks. Um, they come in cookies and cake, ice cream, baked goods, of course, right? Those are sweets, so it has added sugar. 
Um, breakfast cereal. So that's a really interesting one that's noted on the next slide. I go over some of that. Ketchup, barbecue sauce, yogurt, specialty coffee, dr coffee drinks. That's me. Specialty coffee drinks. I have to really be careful about what I order from any coffee shop. I almost always ask for half or no sweetener and I just add it myself because if not then they're adding a bunch of sugar and I can we can get we can kind of lower that sweetness threshold we have and we can get used to eating foods that have less and and consume drinks that have less sugar we just have to get our taste buds adjusted to that sugar and high fructose corn syrup are equally harmful in excess I just put that note there so here are some examples of food high in added sugars. If you remember in the last um, lecture, I was saying you need to be able to read the nutrition facts and be looking at the ingredient labels, start practicing that. Um, if you need more practice, let me know. If you have any questions on, um, on understanding that material, just let me know. We can definitely um, talk on Google Meetup. If you want virtual experience, I can always go over that again. But I just like to add like Capri Sun, Sunny D, High C because I don't know about you guys, but growing up, I mean, my parents thought that those were healthy alternatives when really they don't have much nutrients at all, um, but they are very high in sugar. It would be better or more ideal for our parents or us to make drinks from whole um, fruit and from whole um, vegetables in a blender and give that to our our kids or to our cousins or nieces and nephews rather than giving them Capri Sun, Sunny D, or High C because those are, again, like I said, they don't have much nutrients at all and they are high in sugar. Um, one thing that I, I think is really interesting, um, of course, breakfast cereal, like it's kind of, kind of can be contradictory and confusing because at the top, if you look at these cereal labels, it says a whole grain and it has like calcium and vitamin D if you add, um, if you add milk to their products and, um, they'll, they'll also say like, it's a great source of, um, other vitamins too. And it's just like, okay, but they're really high in sugar. So that can be really confusing and contradictory. And, uh, many parents, um, want to buy these for their kids cause their kids like them, but they're really high in sugar. So, uh, definitely think, consider switching, um, breakfast cereals you don't have to um, some of us like we're diehard fans and maybe that's not where our health journey starts maybe we'll switch out another food or beverage before we switch out our breakfast cereal respect I get that I'm um, just giving you guys different ideas um, for different tweaks we can make to our diet to make it a little healthier last thing I wanted to point out um, what I include on this slide is this this um the front label of the Nature Valley Crunchy Granola Bar, it's also very deceptive. Um, we think granola bars are healthy. I mean, it's made with oats and honey. It seems natural. Um, 16 grams of whole grain. But if you look at the ingredient list, remember it goes by weight. So um, the majority of the product is whole grain oats. But look, the second ingredient is sugar and the third ingredient is oil. So it's just oats, oil, and sugar predominantly. But then you've got some flour in there, and then you've got honey. you got soy flour, and then you have brown sugar syrup. So in this, in this granola bar alone, there are three different sweeteners. So we're getting an excess amount of sugar. Um, here, if you look at the label, you might have to squint a little bit. There's 29 total carbohydrates in this bar. There's only 2 grams of fiber which is really confusing because we're reading 16 gra grams of whole grain, right? Like that must be good. Notice there is a star in the corner of the whole grain. So if you, you have to look around that box to find what that star means. It probably means if you ate the whole package in one sitting. Um, but then if you look at sugars, 12 grams, 12 grams of sugar, and the serving size is two bars, which is one package. So when you eat those two bars, you're getting 12 grams of sugar and it's, but it doesn't it gives you four grams of protein so that's okay and six grams of fat so there are healthier options when it comes to granola bars um i wouldn't consider this a protein bar um i think most protein bars should have nine to ten nine or more grams of protein so just food for thought pun intended we're not gonna go over this this is just um just for extra information if you'd like um, just to recap, more the more added sugars consumed, the greater increased risk for gaining weight, becoming overweight or obese, uh, acquiring type 2 diabetes. It can even be a risk factor for high blood pressure and heart disease. 
Um, tooth decay, I'd mentioned cavities. Sugar can be addictive as well. Um, many RDs recommend eliminating added sugars in the diet. And like I said, the threshold for sweetness goes up um, in our, on our tongue and in our brain. So our body gets used to a certain amount of sh sweetness. So we constantly want that same amount or, um, or once we get used to it, we want more than that. So it's better to lower our sugar intake so it doesn't get worse. Like, so our body doesn't crave more, I should say. Um, these are just interesting measurements. Um, we've talked about starch and fiber. So um, this is more just more information. I'm making sure, I wanted to make sure that I highlight in this uh, presentation things that are specifically going to be on the test. Um, so, okay, so there's a difference between fiber, so there's soluble and insoluble fiber. So soluble fiber swells in water like a sponge, so you feel full longer after eating. Um, and some intestinal bacteria digest it, so great stuff. Insoluble fiber does not swell in water much. Insoluble fiber helps prevent constipation. Um, cool thing about fiber, it binds to cholesterol in the digestive tract and removes it from the body, lowering your blood cholesterol. So for anyone who has heart disease or a family member that has heart disease, one thing that I always recommend is decreasing salt or sodium intake, decreasing saturated fat intake, and increasing fiber intake and healthy fat intake. Um, so once again, just a reminder for the test, a compl the complex carbohydrate fiber is found in plants and it is not digested by um, the digestive enzymes in the body. So just keep that in mind for the test. Um, so where can you get fiber from? High fiber cereals, um, dried beans, peas, and lentils. Those are my go-to. Second go-to would be fruits and vegetables. Um, making sure that you keep the skin on those fruits and vegetables. I've been asked about juices before. I highly recommend smoothies, blending the entire fruit or vegetable if possible because when we take the skins off of the fruits and vegetables, then we're getting rid of some of the fiber, but that fiber helps slow down um, sugar absorption. It also, like how quick our sugar um, spikes in the body, and then it also um, keeps us full longer, and like I said on the last slide, it binds to cholesterol and removes it from the body. So fiber, fiber, fiber is really good for us. If you're not accustomed to having a lot of fiber, make sure to increase it gradually or it will, it can cause constipation. If you increase it gradually and get up to a good amount, which I think I have the recommendation later on for men and women, how much fiber to have in a day. So it should come later. Um, once you get up to that, then it will help prevent constipation and it's nice for good, smooth bowel movements. Whole grains, um, though that's whole grains are another source of fiber, and then nuts and seeds. Um, keeping in mind, fiber is not found in meat, poultry, fish, dairy products, or eggs. So, fiber is only found in these cereals, um, some granolas too, uh, dried beans, peas, and lentils, fruits and whole fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds. So on this slide, we're just there's just two lists if you're really curious about getting how do I increase soluble fiber in the diet, there's some examples there. And if you're interested in increasing insoluble fiber, there are some examples there. I always, like I said in the chapter one uh, presentation, I'm all about a variety diet. A very diet diet with lots of variety. A diet that's high in fiber protects against heart disease by improving blood cholesterol. It decreases risk of developing diabetes because it slows the absorption of glucose after eating. Promotes regularity. What regularity? Bowel movements. <laughs> it's linked to lower body weight. High fiber foods are filling. They give us a feeling of satiety, which means we feel full. And most are low in calories and it is linked to less colon cancer because of that regularity. Again, if you're curious about how do I increase fiber in my diet, whole grain bread, whole grain cereals, whole wheat pasta, um, baked goods with whole wheat flour, fresh and canned fruits right with the skin on, uh, brown rice, and then these sandwiches with vegetables and or peanut butter. Ah, here it is. Fiber recommendations for any of you who are like, I want to increase my fiber. Okay, let's increase it gradually, little by little each day, while also increasing our water intake. But, um... There is an upper limit, right? So 25 grams per day for women is good. 
and then 38 grams per day for men is good. Once we get past the age of 50, the recommendations lower a bit, 21 grams for women and 30 grams for men. So which foods contain starch? You know, the foods that have complex carbohydrates, which are whole grains. Um, another, uh, other foods that have starch, um, root and tuber vegetables, beets, carrots, potatoes, sweet potatoes. Um, so that's really great. So you can incorporate those as well. Okay, you can use starches as thickeners. Um, gelatinization is a process unique to starches, so you find starches frequently used as thickeners in soups, sauces, gravies, puddings, and other foods, which many of you are familiar with. Here's just a picture of different whole grains. Sorry, this, my PowerPoint, I'm trying to move the slide here, and it's, being slow today let's see okay here's another just another slide that goes over whole grains we went over a lot of this in chapter two as well if you see this uh, stamp on the outside of the food product that you're buying then you know that it's got whole grains in it why are whole grains healthy why do we want them because they have vitamins they have minerals phytochemicals as well these are plants um, so they also have phytochemicals which is great and they have fiber just a, a recap a diet high in whole grains reduces your risk of coronary heart disease type 2 diabetes and weight gain So diets rich in whole grain foods and other plant foods and low in saturated fat and cholesterol may help reduce the risk of heart disease. And you see me repeating some of these things in my presentations. That's only because part of my job as a dietitian or like part of my plea as a professor to teaching nutrition is to give you the tools and the information necessary to um, be able to incorporate into your diet or change your diet so that you are preventing disease and living your best, healthiest quality of life life <laughs> um, that's me that's my perspective we can talk about weight gain and weight loss one-on-one uh, -on -one, but I'm more so about starting off with the fundamentals and the foundation um, I believe that food has a huge impact I mean it's not only that I believe it's that I've read the research that food has a huge impact on our overall health Legumes are great. Don't forget about them. Um, they're high in fiber, high in protein, excellent source of complex carbohydrate, low in fat, a good source of many vitamins and minerals, low in sodium. Um, if you purchase a canned version, then get low sodium or no sodium. But otherwise, if you're cooking them yourself, then you're in control of how much salt is put in, into them. And they're cheap. So this is a really great, um, legumes are really great for vegans, vegetarians, and for us meat eaters. Um, but I think they often get left out. So bring them back in. <laughs> and the last slide, just legumes on the menu. Um, these are just examples of different ways that you can incorporate legumes. So I try to include um, a couple of slides here and there with each chapter uh, to end with. So that way, when you start prepping for your group project, uh, you have some ideas here. Alrighty, thank you so much for joining me for chapter three. Please let me know if you have any questions and be on the lookout for review questions that I post in the discussion post. Thank you. Until next time.